morning. morning. How's everyone doing? You doing good? Good. How many like that song, It Is Good, He Is Good? I tell you, I mean, if you, uh, I don't know how many, you know, a lot of, I guess I used to be the rarity, but now it's pretty normal to not have a good family a lot of times. But I want to tell you, uh, God is good. You know what I mean? They say if you haven't had a good earthly father, a lot of times we project that to our heavenly Father, but um, I want us to kn- you to know that He is good, and we sometimes need to proclaim that even if we don't feel it. Amen. And so we need to. That's why we sing it over. Some people say, "Why do we sing these songs so much?" Because how many know we got to get that into our spirit? We got to get to we we know that He is good even when we don't feel it. Because I'll tell you, like I was saying there prophetically, is that that Satan tries so hard to distance you and God to get you. God never pulls away from you. But he wants us to pull away from God. Anyone ever struggle with that? Anyone out there? Any other sinners out there? Two of you. Okay, good. But, uh, you know, sometimes. And we need to just be honest to say he's good and declare it and say, I don't care. That's why the Bible says to walk by faith and not by sight. If we walk by sight, if we let this life interpret how God is, then we're going to think he's bad. But if we let the word and his spirit interpret, we will trust him and we'll see him get us through the hardest of times. Amen. And he said, and how many know, Jesus didn't lie. He said, in this life you will suffer persecution. It's going to be hard times sometimes. There's going to be trials and tribulations. He didn't lie to us. So, you know, if you think, hey, what's going on? That Jesus said that's part of being in a sinful world. How many longing for heaven? Yeah, baby. The older you are, the more you like heaven, right? When you're young, like, hey. But when you're old, yes. (laughs) But anyways, hey, happy Mother's Day. Let's give the moms a clap. (laughs) Woo! Happy Mother's Day. I want to show a quick clip. Does anyone know um, Tim Hawkins? Anyone know Tim Hawkins? He's a Christian comedian, and he's a really funny guy. He's a great guy. He's almost as funny as I am. No, I'm kidding, just kidding. But he's very funny. And uh, he, I want you to look at this clip, but it shows how, for those of you who are dads, and you have a mom and, you know, your wife, and it shows you how to treat your wife. And it shows you kids how to treat your mom on Mother's Day and things not to say to her. So here's a clip of what not to say to your mom. <laughs> We're losing our minds together. <laughs> and if you are married, I'll give you this advice. Go to counseling. That's not a joke. I'm being serious, man. Even if your marriage is good, go to counseling. It's just maintenance for your marriage. Because at counseling, they give you conflict resolution tools to help you because there will be conflict. If you're married, there will be conflict. You need some help. Like one of the conflict resolution tools they teach in marriage is ask questions. When you have a disagreement, don't just start spewing out what you think. Make it worse. Ask questions. Try to relate. Make it better. I used that last week. My wife and I got into a disagreement. It got hot. It got heated. We started a fight. I stopped myself right there. Start asking questions. Honey, why are you being a psycho right now? (laughs) After I came to about an hour later, I... uh, Pulled the butter knife out of my shoulder. (laughs) I came to a conclusion. That was a dumb question. (laughs) Whoever said that, there's no such thing as a dumb question. They weren't married. (laughs) It pays to treat mom right. Or you could say if your wife isn't pregnant, you could say if she doesn't have kids, you could say it pays to treat your wife right or mom right, but it can be mom or wife right. But this is, uh, for those of you who aren't married yet, some of you go, well, I'm not married, I don't care. Hear this, because this will teach you how to be a good husband and how to be a good son to your, to your mom, how to treat them, how to treat your, your mom or your wife. And so we want to see that. Let's pray and ask God to just bless this time. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for moms, Lord. And Lord, one of the names, your names is El Shaddai. And part of that meaning in the Hebrew is many-breasted one that infers that your love is like the love of a mom. And you even say in your word that you say, will a mother forsake the child at her breast? But even if your mother forsakes you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so, Father, thank you that you are a loving Father, that you are strong Father, you have that masculinity, that strength, but you also have that tender mercy and loving kindness of a mother, a steadfast love. And so, Father, I pray, I thank you for the moms in this congregation. 
I thank you for that in this life where it's so crazy, where men are trying to be women and women are trying to be men and, and just all the blurring of, 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 of males and females. Lord, thank you for moms. Amen. Thank you for women. And we just want to honor them today, Lord. You said, give honor to whom honor is due. So, Father, we ask for your blessing on all the moms in this church, that you would encourage them, Father. If there's any estrangement with a son or a daughter that's fallen away, Lord, encourage them. Help them to pray for their children. Help them to believe that you are a good, good father, and you're drawing those kids. You love their children more than they do, and you're wanting to draw them back. So bless every mother. Let this message encourage them and speak to them. And let it show us as, as, as sons and as daughters and as, as husbands how to treat our wives and how to treat our moms. How your word tells us to treat women of God. So Father, we ask that you would lead us. Your word says that your Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. So Father, let these truths not just be truths we know, but let us be effectual doers of this truth. And we agree with that prayer said? Amen. 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 When the will of Henry, uh, Henry Hines from the Hines 57 sauce, you know, Hines 57 ketchup, when he is, his will was read, here's what he said. It was one of the confessions in his will. He said, Look, looking forward to the time when my earthly career will end, I desire to set forth at a very beginning of this will as most important item in it, a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I declare to bear witness to the fact that throughout my life, which there was unusual joys and some sorrows, I have been wonderfully sustained by my faith in God through Jesus Christ. This legacy was left to me by my consecrated mother, a woman of strong faith, and to her I attribute any success I have attained. Thank you much, Mom. How many like that? How many moms like your son to say that about you? Right? You want that. And I'll tell you, the saying is so true that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rocks the world. Amen? It's amazing to me how much a mom affects. I mean, my kids, my sons love me, but if they have a pick between mom or me, when they're hurt, who they're going, mom, right? Because dad's like, why'd you do that? What's wrong with you? Come on, don't run in the house, you know. But mom's, oh, pumpkin sugar booger. I mean, she just love them. And there's something about a mom, you know. I, I didn't know my mom. She died when I was six. But I'll tell you, I know how powerful the words are of a mom. My grandmother was kind of like a mom to me, and I remember, I think I've told you this, but my grandma used to tell me, because she was hurt, she, her mom died when she was six, and she was raised by a stepmom, she was sort of like Cinderella, and her, so she had a hard life with her stepmom, and she used to tell me this all the time, when she'd put me into bed, and I think she would, she would think this was helping me, but it kind of has really stunt me a little bit, I've had to, years of, of the Lord trying to renew it, but she would say, Craig, just know this, nobody really cares. How many know that will change your life, not for the good, if you believe that? And God said to say, let me rephrase that, as some of you have heard me say before, nobody cares like me. Amen? But you see, the devil will try to say, nobody cares. And so when you're a kid, without Jesus, you go, if nobody cares about me, then I don't care about anyone else. But if your mom's told you that I love you, and most of all, God loves you, and your dad's told you that, how many know you are secure? Oh, you might have doubts, but you know, wait a sec, I know that there's a God because I've seen the love of God through my mom. I know there's a God because I've seen the love of God through my dad. I know because I've seen the love of God through my church. That's why I'm going to tell you guys, that's why it's so important to be a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Because it's not just supposed to be where you check your card and you just come in once a month and check it and get out. It's to be where you're part of the body, where you know that you have people that love you and care about you. You go through a hardship, you have people that will pray for you and will love you and care about you. Amen. How many want that? Isn't that funny how all of us want that, but we're so afraid of that? Amen? Because if you get close to people, guess what can happen too? You can get hurt, right? And I'm so glad that no one ever gets hurt in this church, right? You know, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, I won't go into that. I take too much time. But I, I tell you, so we, I'll tell you one story. It's so funny. It's so funny. I had this person. They're not here now, so I can say this. This is what I tell people. If you're going to leave, don't leave bad, because I will talk about you, okay? No, but anyway, so, so I said, this lady came up to me after church. She just goes, Craig, 
that was not the worst sermon you've ever done, but pretty close. And I just want to encourage you that for a frat guy, you don't sweat much. No, she didn't say that, but she pretty much just said this harsh stuff, and I'm just like, I don't like you. I didn't say, you know, you can't say that, but I'm just like, why is it your job to keep me, like, crushed? You know, I, I mean, it was just so sad. And how many know that sometimes we think that's our job? But I want to tell you, our job is really to encourage each other. I tell you, God, you know, sometimes I think I got to beat the church, and I got to get the church back for God. But you know what God said to me? He said this, it was my love that drew you to me. Now let my love in you draw other people to myself. How many know people are touched a lot more by love than they are by harshness or judgment? You know, I tell you, I don't know about you guys, but do you ever, do you, anyone out there get critical ever? Whew. I am amazed how critical. I can just, you tell me so. I, I, I can joke about anything. I can tell about anybody's tease about anything. And the Lord's like, why do you do that? And I don't know. It's just, I think it's just, I don't know. I say, I blame it on being a New Yorker, but how many know it's just not godly? And we should, our tongues should be able to bless and encourage people. We can have fun, right? But we should make it sure that the other person's laughing too and not just, that was all free right there. Anyway, I better move on. <laughs> First Peter 3, 7. Wait. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, your wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen? We're going to go through that verse. So just park right there, and we're going to show some other verses, but that's our main verse I want us to look at, unpack that. Here it is. Dwell with them. A godly husband abides with his wife. He doesn't merely just share a house with her, but he truly lives with her, and hear this, he truly loves her. How many know you can live with your wife and not really love her? As Christ. Remember what he says, what Jesus gave for us in Ephesians 5? He says, Husbands, love your wife. And you go, okay, I can do that. But he says this, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now I want to tell you this laying down your life for your wife, how many can say that's kind of easy to say as a man? I'd be willing to do that, right? But laying your life down to love her and care about her in everyday life, how many know that's a little harder sometimes? Amen? Oh, two guys, come on, guys. Am I. Okay, great. Yes, I have problems with this. Yeah, you know, I can take a bullet for my wife, but to listen, to care, to love her, to, you know, think about Jesus. When he's on the cross, he's dying. He could say, hey, it's about me right now. What did he say? He says, mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He prayed for the thief. He cared about others while he was dying an agonizing death. How many know that's the kind of love that it is? We say, you know, sometimes I'll go, honey, uh, I'm getting ready for my sermon. It's about me right now. And the Lord's saying, I would still care about your wife. I would still care and realize that I can multitask. I'm going to tell you, I have a hard time with that. How many men out there have a hard time with that? I mean, wow. But God says we are to love her. There's an old saying that says they used to walk alone, but then they got married and walked alone together. I want to tell you, sadly, there is too many couples, even in the church, that walk alone together. And God says that shouldn't be. God says this in Genesis 2, 24. You don't have to turn there, but just write it down, and you can look at it later. A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Hear this. And the two are united into one or to become one. Do you realize that? God just doesn't want you just to hook up on the honeymoon, love each other once. He wants you to become one all the time. You are one. God sees you as two separate. You get married and now you're one flesh. Isn't that amazing? One flesh. And you say, well, okay, whatever. Hear this to prove this. Did you know that the word one here, the two are united as one, is the word the akkad. Akkad. The same word used to show the trinity in the Old Testament. Hear this. Deuteronomy 6.4 says this. This is the great Shema. This is what all the Jewish people pray above their doors. They put above their doors. It's their prayer. They start with every prayer. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now hear this. The Jewish people will tell you they don't understand this verse. They understand it, but they don't understand it. This word God here is the word, as some of you know, Elohim. And Elohim here is plural. It's plural. It means more than one. Plural. It's not here 
O Israel, the Lord thy God, one God, is saying God. Here, O Israel, could say the Lord our gods, the Lord is one. It's plural. The, the singular word for God here it would be El. But the Jewish leaders, the rabbis say, we don't know why it's plural here. Well, well you know why, right? Because it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool how God did that? How even in the Old Testament, and then and you ask a Jewish rabbi, they'll say, yeah, it's plural. But here, here it is, plural. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, some of you may be saying, but Craig, it says that the Lord is one, yes. But hear this, the word one here is a compound unity. A compound unity, I'm told. I, I don't, I, this is beyond me, but I'm told this. Meaning that, the, that there is one God in three separate persons. Does that make sense to you? One God and three separate persons. And so even though a husband and wife are two different people, in God's eyes, they are a compound unity. You're one. Amen? You're one. You're one. In God's eyes, the two of you are yet one flesh, the akkad, the same word used to describe God. One, but three separate persons. This is why I believe God says in Matthew 19, 6, he says this, Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one separate them, for God has joined them together. Do you see that now? separating someone, divorcing your wife or your husband in Lester's grounds, uh, biblical grounds is like trying to tear apart the Trinity in God's eyes. How many of that changes things, doesn't it? it? It's tearing apart the Trinity. And so we need to see that. That's why God says he hates divorce. And how many know we should turn that around in the church? Amen? Now, if you've been divorced, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to encourage you. God is a gracious and merciful God. But hear this. Divorce is almost as high in the church as it is the world. How many know that should change? Divorce should not be as high in the church of Jesus Christ as it is the world. And hear this. There are grounds for divorce, and here it is. In my opinion, a man or woman that is separated from their spouse without biblical grounds like adultery. How many know adultery is a grounds for divorce? Now, you don't have to divorce, but you can. And I heard this once. A scholar said this. <clears throat> The reason why, there's only three ways to really be separated from your spouse, and that's death, right? You're not, no longer married. Adultery, and the unbelieving spouse departing. Amen? I mean, that's it. Pretty much three. Now, people try to say physical abuse and, you know, don't deal with your wife harshly in Malachi, but that's not real, real clear. You know what I mean? I would say separation and work on it, but I would say you don't just bounce because things are rough. But hear this. Adultery, they say the reason why is because when someone commits adultery, what happened in the Old Testament? They were killed. So in God's eyes, when you commit adultery, in a sense, you're dead to that marriage because you committed adultery, and so you would be dead. So that's why the person is free. If they don't want to reconcile, they're free to not be married anymore. To Then the other case of, of divorce is the unbelieving spouse leaves them. That means if you got saved as non or you, you got married as non-Christians, and then one of you gets saved, and then all of a sudden, say your husband, you get saved, and your wife says, hey, I like to party, I like to boogie, I like the nightlife, I don't want to be married to you, then the Bible says you can let them leave, and you're no longer bound, and that's found in 1 Corinthians 7.15. But hear this, hear this, if that unbelieving spouse wants to stay with you, the Bible says you're to stay with them and to try to win them. But if they say, I want out, either renounce Christ, or I want out, then you let them get out and you are not bound to that, it says in 1 Corinthians 7.15. To God, as I said, divorce without biblical grounds is like trying to separate the Trinity. How many know we should care about divorce in an unbiblical way? Amen? I tell you, now you have people in the church that did divorce. Why do you divorce? I just don't like them anymore. How many know that's not grounds? How many know there's times where God could not like us? Could you imagine if God said, there's a little divorce paper on your pillow, I'm done. You know, that'd be pretty sad, wouldn't it? And guess what? We've all given him reason to do that, if he, right? How I many know he loves you by choice, not because you're so cute and you're always the sweetest little thing on the earth? Amen? Some of you are going, what are you talking about? I'm sweet. No. That's why Jesus also said this in Matthew 5.32. He says, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, adultery, 
causes her to commit adultery. Because if you divorce her for no biblical reason, then if she gets remarried, she's committing adultery. And hear this one. This is a scary one. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Meaning any woman, my friend did this, and I remember saying to him, Greg, he, his wife, his, his wife um, was divorced, basically got young, married young, and the wife, is, she just said, I don't love him anymore, and she divorced him. Then they got married. How many know the Bible says that's committing adultery? You know what's scary about that? How do you repent of that? Amen? It's quiet. I could tell someone's like, this is supposed to be a Mother's Day message. You're just making it mean. No, but isn't that wild? Isn't that wild? How do you repent of that? God's a gracious God, isn't he? But I mean, that is wild. That is wild. There's a lot of adulterous marriages in the church. Why? Because God has made and sees them as one flesh, a compound unity. And hear this, if you get mad at me, then get mad at me because I'm John the Baptist. Do you remember what John the Baptist, what made Herod kill him? Do you remember what the reason was? Because he's preaching to Herod about having his brother's wife. Remember? And the wife was so mad at him, right? She she dumped her other Herod's brother and became married to. The Herod, Herod of the Bible. And so what happened? John the Baptist preached against it. How many know we don't like to be told that our sin is sin? Even in the church. And that's why there's people that just are so cute and just, you know, there's so many pastors now that just say God loves you, doesn't care what you do, just do anything. And he says, yay. How many know that's a lie? God loves you. I love the saying when I first got saved. I got saved in the Jesus movement and people said, God loves you just the way you are. But he loves you so much, he's not going to leave you this way. How many of that's we need to get back to that? He loves you, but he's going to also now conform you into the image of his son. And that means living like his son. A true man of God also recognizes the great point that the Apostle Paul made on, on marriage in Ephesians 5.28. He said this, In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man is actually loving himself when he loves his wife. Being hard on your wife is like punching your own body. It's like being, man. do you remember, and you say, oh, I don't love my, you know, someone say, Craig, look at, do I love my body? I don't know. But, but hear this, is I don't try to physically hurt myself. You know, I don't go ride on a motorcycle and try to jump off, you know, just to see how it feels. I don't do that. I care about myself. And how many know? If we cared about our wives the way we care about ourselves, how many of our wives would be happy? And, and, and I, people say, well, I don't even like myself. You know, what's that song by Whitney Houston? The greatest gift is to love yourself. How many of you know the Bible teaches you love yourself just fine? The reason why some of you are so discouraged is because you love yourself so much, you can't believe other people don't love you as much as you love yourself. <laughs> I'm awesome. Why don't you love me? You, you people, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take myself out of this world. That's, hey, I can talk the way because that's the way I thought. I was going to commit suicide and show my family. You, you hurt me, I'm going to show you. It was self-love, most of it. Because I believed that, man, if you only knew how great I was, you should love me. Isn't that wild? The Bible says you love yourself just fine. Love your neighbor as yourself and love your wife. Husbands, love your wife as you love yourself. And hear this. He says, do unto others you haven't done to you. The way you want, what you want, sow it. You want respect, sow respect. You want love, sow love. You know, Bible promises what a man sows, he reaps. If you're not getting love from your wife, then sow love. You're not getting respect, then sow respect to her. Amen? Amen. You guys are getting quiet on me. (laughs) Thank you. Why? Because there's only one, they are only one in God's eyes. And God's godly husband understands the essential unity that God has established between a husband and wife. So he greatly, a good husband, greatly loves her and does his, as he does his own body. Then he says, with understanding. Treat her with understanding. A godly hun, husband undertakes the important job of understanding his wife. And how many know that's just easy to do, isn't it? <laughs> right? I love, let's, this is Mother's Dad, better be nice, but let's be real. You girls aren't always easy to understand. Okay, I love like one, I'll just give one. My wife, I go, hey, honey, let's go eat dinner. Okay, where do you want to go eat? I don't care. Okay, well, let's go to Outback. Not Outback! 
what is, when you say I don't care, that means anything's open, doesn't it? But to my wife, it means you should know the parameters of anything of I don't care. I don't care means something with salad and some tofu. That's what anything means. <laughs> or another thing is this. Do these jeans make me look fat? <laughs> what? And if you pause a second, you're in trouble. Amen? No, you look great. Perfect. Awesome. Woo! Later. Gotta go. You know, I mean, we get set up sometimes. I'm just going to say that right now. But anyways, uh, treat her with understanding. By knowing her well, the husband is able to demonstrate his love for her far more effectively. When a husband has understanding, understanding, God directs him to use it to dwell with his wife with understanding. He is supposed to take his understanding of her and apply it to daily life with his wife. This is where men have trouble following through. They may have understanding about their wives their wife, but they don't use it to dwell with them. I want to tell you this, guys. Hear this, wives. This is for you to help you out to understand this. I, how many, has anyone seen love and respect? Has everyone seen love and respect? How many know men and women are supposed to be different? Now, this generation is trying to say they're not, but how many know they are, right? And they're supposed to be different. How many, how many are glad that your wife is different than you? I'm glad, okay? I don't want to have a, a goatee growing contest with my wife. I don't want that, okay? But, but hear this. How many know your strengths of a, man, of a man is your weakness to your wife? And your strengths of a woman is a weakness to your husband? That's when you're going, what? Hear this. The same, how, what do we hear women say about husbands all the time? Oh, he's a pig. He's so emotionally dead. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't feel anything. He's so emo- I, I can't connect with him. He's just like, I don't know, just kiss in front of the TV. Right? Look at some wife's going, that's you. No, but, uh, <laughs> but hear that. Now, men need to get better to connect and understand their wives, but hear this. Wives, so you have a little compassion. That same kind of shut off his emotions is the same strength that makes a man go into the 9-11 towers when he knows he's probably not coming out. Amen? It's the same strength when you hear a noise in the night and you go, honey, check it out. You know? Now, how many know us guys are just as scared as you are? <laughs> but we go, Okay. You know, I mean, you know, we do that because why? We can shut up. Our, you know, what's the big deal of death? A 45 in the head, I can take it. You know, we just kind of shut it off. But how many know sometimes we shut it off with you? And how many know it's a balance? It's a strength. And, and guess what? I'm not saying that as an excuse that us husbands should not learn to connect emotionally with our wives. But how many know it's, it takes work for us? But now let's reverse it. The wife, she's so emotional, right? I tell you, my kids fall down. They go, oh, pumpkin, you're so, oh, precious, right? She loves them. She's so gracious. She's so encouraging. But that same grace and encouragement also opens her to what? Deception. To being soft in Christianity. Hear this. You go, what are you talking about? We used to, I used to have an assistant here that was probably one of the toughest ladies I've ever known. She was like a drill sergeant. And this woman, what happened is someone on our worship team uh, was uh, they weren't married and they were kind of, uh, how do you say it, they were fellowshipping before marriage. <laughs> and so I kind of discerned it and they didn't come clean, so I discerned it. And when, how do we know? It's the difference between coming clean and getting caught. And they got caught and so I was a little frustrated because I sensed it and uh, just felt like they're from the Lord. And I went to them and they were like, you know, you could just tell when it's like, huh? you know, and I said, I'm sensing this. And so I said, I said, Lord, what do I do? I said, you need to be off the worship team for six months. Just serve and be off the worship team. Now, how many know, because <laughs> we always take correction very well as people. How many know, they got a little petition of people to say, I think that's still way too long. And I said, well, when you're the pastor, you can tell whatever you want. But I'm the pastor, and I'm saying six months. But hear this. The two, some of the two toughest ladies in our church said, that's too harsh. That's too hard. And why? Because they're so compassionate. Do you see the weakness there? How many know? I mean, how many know? My kids, you ask them if they'll be honest with you. There's a difference between dad spanking and mommy spanking. Mommy spanking. My spanking. I mean, they're like, whoa! Right, my? <laughs> hey, man, hallelujah. You know, I mean, that's spanking. Oh, man. I think her, their grandma felt it sometimes. I mean, it was a hard spanking. And uh, difference. Anyways, does that make sense there? I took about 20 minutes on that. Sorry about that. But anyways, 
This is where men, you know, have trouble. Husbands should be understanding and be considered their wives' spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. And I want to tell you, I'm the worst at this. This message is mostly for me. I'll just tell you that. And some of you go, good, because I don't want to have it. But anyways, this, I, I sometimes, you know, I give all day at the office. So when I get home, the last thing I want to do is just spill, honey. Tell me what you're feeling. I just want to veg. Now, we don't have cable, so I don't get to do the clicker thing, but I just kind of, I don't know what I do. I just wander the yard. But I mean, I don't want to talk, you know? And my wife's with kids all day, so she just wants to, you know, she wants to tell me. Not the, oh, 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 she didn't do that, but you know what I mean. I've been married to Teresa for 22 years. Well, she told me last night, it's 20, yeah, there you go. But I got in trouble for that. It's only been 21 years. I'm kind of speeding it up. This November will be 22, so 21. So she goes, you don't even know where our anniversary is. But anyways, <laughs> so 20-ish years we've been married. And I'm just starting to learn what makes her happy. And knowing the right years makes her happy. And I didn't do it. But anyways, <laughs> and I'm learning what makes her sad. And I've been, you know, I have found that if my wife is happy, then I'm happy. And if my wife is sad, then I'm usually not happy. How many know that? The saying, happy wife, happy life. It's true. Okay? And, and they'll say, well, it's the same with daddy. Trust me. But, uh, but wife, you know, it's the same way. Because my wife has a way. She can just get, you know, she's just so cute about it. You know, I get cranky. Everyone knows I'm not happy. My wife's just, it's fine. It's all right. It's good. I'm good. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's all right. You know, it's good. You know, and it's like, I, mean, I wish you would just sometimes just yell at me. Amen? But she's just so sweet about it, it really gets me. You know, they say a, a quiet answer crushes the bone. I am crushed sometimes. Amen? So anyway, one survey revealed that the average husband and wife only spend, hear this, 37 minutes in communication together. 37 minutes out of 168 hours in a week. How I many? that's not very much communication. And I will tell you that sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, I, my wife, you know, sometimes will be like yelling out the door, need do this, do this, make sure you do this. I mean, and sometimes, I mean, is anyone guilty of that? No, <laughs> look at him, it's like, Dude, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about, right? But I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that, being so busy that sometimes I don't really communicate with my wife, you know? We'll go on a date night, and we'll sometimes just, you know, talk about all that we need to do, and we won't really talk about each other. I mean, it takes, I mean, can anyone out there be humble and raise their hand? I know you don't like to raise your hand, but admit, sometimes it's hard to connect with your wife, to really be close, and not just, yeah, look at someone's pulling a husband's hand up. Ah, ah no. You know. Well, I'll say it for you liars, that yes, sometimes it's hard. And I'm pretty, and my wife will tell you, I, I am a talker, as some of you know. Some of you go, hey, we can tell, trust me. But I talk. But sometimes it's like, because I've talked out here, I don't like to always talk at home. Amen? You know, Bing Cosby, I don't know if you remember Bing, does anyone remember Bing, Bing Cosby? Bing Cosby? Remember him? Everyone loved him. Bing, how do you say it? Bing Crosby. What? Crosby. Bing Crosby, yeah. yeah. But he, he was the father of our nation, they said. But yet his own son said, I was so distant from my father. Isn't that funny? The people that we think are so loving are sometimes the not so loving at their house because they give at the office. And I want to tell you, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know what other professions, if you're a counselor or something, I maybe mean, it's the same thing. But I want to tell you, it takes work to communicate. Not work because I don't love my wife, but work to, like I said, give my life to her when I feel tired and I don't want to and it's not easy to do. But we need to have better communication. Is it any wonder that marriages fall apart? After children grow up and leave the home, the husband and wife are left alone with total strangers. You know what I mean? I don't want that. You know what I mean? That's what I think my wife, because of that, she wants to adopt like 20 kids, so she never has to be. No, okay. But, you know, she doesn't have to be alone with me. No, okay. But, you know, but I want to work on that. You know, I want to work to where I know my wife. I love my wife. I, she know, I do love my wife, but she knows I love it. I love her. Because I always tell her, right, honey? I always say I love you. I am good at saying I love you. I'm not one of those, I love you. I can say, honey, I love you. Love you. But do I show that I love her? Do I prove that I love her by spending time with her? Some of you men are looking at me like, you are really a jerk. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble now after this message. Well, <laughs> Got to give you some homework. <laughs> okay. But anyways, giving honor. Let's look at that part. A godly husband knows how to make his wife feel honored. 
Godly honor means that the husband respects his wife's feelings, her thinking, her desires. He may not always agree with her ideas, but he definitely respects and listens to them. And I want to tell you that's something I've had to learn because, you know, I get so many people telling me how to run a church. And so when my wife says, hey, I want you to do this, I'm like, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. But I know I a lot of times miss out on amazing advice when I don't listen to my wife. I need to listen to her, and I need to let her feel honored. Sometimes my wife has told me, other people seem to have your ear more than me. How many know besides God, my wife should probably have my ear the most? Amen. Amen? And so I need to honor her, and we should honor our wives, giving honor to them. And giving honor to the wife, the word here, hear this, in the Greek language for wife is a rare word, meaning more literally the feminine one. The feminine one. It suggests that a woman's feminine nature should prompt the husband to honor her. As I said earlier, how many are excited that your wife is different than you? Amen? I'm excited that my wife goes, how you doing? What's up? How are, how are the curls going today? I'm glad my wife does not compete with me to be a man. Now, how many know that's changing in our society? Amen? That's changing, you know? Like the old song, remember, girls will be guys and guys will be girls. How many know that's our reality? And we're, we're not celebrating the differences of the sexes anymore. We're trying to make them one, right? Guys are trying to look like girls, and girls are trying to look like guys. You know the scripture in Corinthians, I think it's 11, where it says that to a, a long hair to a man is his shame, and short hair to a woman is her shame. And people say, oh, you can't have long hair. No, that's not what that's saying. What it's saying in the Greek there is that a man should look like a man, and a woman should look like a woman. Amen? That was a wit. Amen! Amen? It should look, you should be proud. Guys should not be wearing skinny jeans for Jesus. <laughs> so you're going, oh my goodness. No, no. <laughs> you know, we should look like men, right? And women should look like women. And it's saying her feminine nature is what makes you want to honor her. Because she's, she's a woman, you know? I, I mean, uh, you know, I've had a lot of sin in my life, but that's not one sin I've had. I like that my wife is a woman, Amen. And we should celebrate that. And we, should be th- we shouldn't say, oh, she's a woman. We should be glad, right, that she is different than us, that she is feminine, that she, you know, is, is oh, you know, that she doesn't go, you know, ha, 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 that she, oh, you know, she gets scared. We should like that. You know, as a man, we have been taught at a very young age to never hit a woman. But here's something I want to say that humbly, I wonder how many of us men have hit our wives Verbally, by harsh words. I was taught in a family, both sides of my family, to be harsh. Harsh words. German, Italian, harsh. And I struggle. And I know you go, oh, Pastor Craig. Yeah, I struggle with getting angry. And I struggle with yelling, you know. And, and that's just, you know, I can make excuses all day. But how many know that that is not right? That we should treat them Honor them and not do this. Hear this, you know, I'll tell you this, that the Lord showed me this, that my wife is his daughter. And just like if, you know, I didn't know her dad, her dad hasn't been in the picture, but, but she had a godly grandpa. But how many know I would never, in front of her godly grandpa, yell at her? Because why? I'd one, be afraid he'd pound me, but two, I wouldn't want to grieve him because he'd be like, why are you doing this to my granddaughter? How many know that God the Father looks at your wife like that? And he says, why are you treating my daughter like this? Why are you treating her so harshly? She's my daughter. Now, hear this so you get it balanced. The wife, husband, God's also saying to wives, why are you treating my husband that I've given you with such disrespect? It's a two-way street, amen? But we need to see that, that this is just, you know, this is something. I, I always try to say to my sons, remember, just like you don't want some guy to do something to your sister or your mom, Remember, when you treat a wife, when you are courting a girl, remember, this is somebody's sister, this is somebody's daughter. And you treat them the way you would want some guy to treat your daughter, or your, I'm sorry, your, your sister, amen? And doesn't the Bible say that? It says, I, I love kids, you always say this to me. They say, now, how far can you go on a date? You know what the Bible says? Young men treat women with absolute purity like a sister. I said, whatever you can do with your sister. <laughs> oh, sick! There it is. If you can make out your sister, go for it. But mm, no, you know what I mean? It's saying you should treat them with absolute purity. Amen? How many, how many, how many of you believe that? That would change. Hey, you're my, back off, sister, until we're married. You know what I mean? This is weird, you know? 
Sorry, I just want to keep your attention. Yeah. This was radical teaching in the world that Peter lived in. In the ancient culture, a husband had absolute rights over his wife. A wife virtually had no rights in the marriage. No rights at all. In the Roman world, the Roman culture, a man could catch his wife in the act of adultery and could kill her right on the spot and have no consequence. Just kill her right there. Just kill her dead, and that would be all right. But if a wife caught her husband, she could do nothing against him. The duties and obligation of marriage were totally put on the wife. How many know God says, no, no, no? God's radical teaching through Peter here is that the husband also has God-ordained duties and obligations towards his wife, and he'll be accountable to God for how he treats his wife. Hear this. Husbands, every man wants to say, I'm the head of this house. Treat me with respect. I'm the head. But how many know with much responsibility comes much, or with much authority comes much responsibility? Everyone wants to demand the respect, but nobody wants to realize you are going to give an account for your house. You're going to give an account how you treated your wife, how you treated your kids, how you governed your household. That's why the Bible says in, in 1 Timothy, I think, 3, it says, let, it says, let there be few teachers or let their elders should be able to manage their own household. They say, if you can't manage your own household, how can you manage the household of God? Amen? So we need to manage our household well. And then it says here, as the weaker vessel. Not only are we to have knowledge of our wives, but we are to honor them as a weaker vessel. Hear this, what this means. It means that a woman is like a vase. She's like a vase. You know, you have a vase, and those Ming Dynasty vases, or whatever you call them, they're like $5,000. How many know you would not play catch with a vase? You would not spit, you, how many wives would love your husband spit tuning in the vase, you know, and throwing popcorn seeds in it? No. Because it's precious. It, it's, it, you're to treat it as a weaker vessel, as a precious vase. That's the way a wife is to be to you. That you treat her delicately because she's so precious to you. Amen? Amen. The idea of her being a weaker vessel does not mean that she's intellectually or morally or spiritually inferior. In some ways, I think women are way smarter than us and way more spiritual than us. On the contrary, her weakness stems from her innate desire for spirituality. In the Garden of Eden, it was Eve that Satan seduced. Not to party, not to get drunk, but to be more spiritual. Eve was the weaker vessel in the sense that she was more vulnerable to Satan's suggestion that if she ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that she would what? Be more like God. Do you hear that? That was her vulnerability. It wasn't to be, do something bad. You could say, well, well, wait, he said don't do it. But she was deceived because he said, yeah, yeah, I know God said that. But if you eat this, you'll be like God. Not you will be God, you'll be like him. And she went, I want that. Do you see the vulnerability there? See, because she's wanting it, but she's deceived because God said don't do that. How I many know the ends does not justify the means in Christianity? When God says don't do something, it's never do it. Not, oh, now you can do it. It's no, don't ever do it. And he said, don't eat from this tree or you will die. But she felt that she could do that, and that's found in Genesis 3, 5. This helps me to understand that my wife innately has a desire for the Lord that will a lot of times surpass my own. How many know this? The church is a lot of times ran by women. How many notice that? And that's not right. It's not right. Hear that, guys. It's time for us. I know we're busy. I know, but how many know the man, there's two places that the woman is not supposed to rule. And that's one what? The house and the church. Now, that's changing, right? You have women pastors. Even the Bible says that a woman should not teach a man, 1 Timothy 2.12. But you have that happening because why? Because men are not stepping up. But I want to tell you this, men. We need to step up. I believe that revival will not come to church or churches like this until men step up and take their rightful place at the head of the table to be servant leaders. Not dominant, harsh leaders, but to be servant leaders like Christ. Amen? Amen. And we need that. And I tell you, and women, hear this. If you've been the leader in the home, how many know it's hard to give that up once you've had it? Some women go, I want, I've been praying for my husband, now he's becoming a leader. I don't want to give it up. But you've got to want that because that is a godly order. And you'll be blessed, amen? You'll be blessed when, you're, when husbands are the head 
And they're loving their wife as Christ of the church, and wives are submitting and respecting and trusting. How I many it takes a lot of faith, women, to trust your husband? Because we ain't smart a lot of times. <laughs> you know? But to say, hey, I trust God that you're working through him. And that'll make you pray too, right? <laughs> oh, God, help him, help him, help him. Have a brain like mine. No, but anyways. <laughs> Heirs together. I'm almost done. A godly husband also realized that his spouse is not only his wife, but she is also his sister in Christ. And she's going to inherit all the things that you inherit. I mean, we're not Mormons here where we believe we're gonna, I'm going to have my spiritual planet. And if my wives, more than one, are good to me, I'll let them come into my planet. I mean, you have to have a trick like that to get many wives. <laughs> you don't please me? Hmm. You'll just be floating around banging in the clouds. But if you please me, then I'll, I'll welcome you into my celestial kingdom. When I heard that as a pagan, I was like, sign me up! <laughs> but how many know the Bible doesn't say that, amen? The Bible says you're joint heirs. There's no special men's heaven and girls' heaven. It's all the same, and you get the same. You're joint heirs with us, and we're joint heirs with you. Part of our inheritance in the Lord is only realizing, is some of this is realizing our oneness, the akkad, as a husband and wife. Heirs together, this rem reminds us of husbands that even though we have been given great authority within our marriage, our wives, hear this, have still e are equal to us in spiritual privilege, eternal purpose. They are joint heirs with us. Hear this. The Bible teaches that a man and women are equal. Hear this. But they both have different roles. Hear this, guys. I want to get this clear, and I know this is going long, but hear this. There's only two places a woman cannot be the head of, and that's the home, if there's a husband there, and the church. But hear this. A, a wife can be the president of the United States. A woman can be a president of the United States. A woman can be the president of a corporation, Farina, whatever. You can do that, but she cannot be, there should not be a woman pastor. The Bible teaches that, and you can talk to me about it later. 1 Timothy 2.12. And a woman should not be the head of the house. But hear this, guys. If you won't do it, then God, by default, will do will allow his wife to step the, your wife to step up. But how many know that is not God's ideal? And the reason our country is kind of faltering is because you have women running the church. We need men to run the church. We need men to step up and be God leaders and to say, "Here I am, Lord, send me." And I know, guys, Amen. I know how busy you are, but how many know that God says? His way is the best way, right? And we need to say like Jesus, not my will, but you're already done. A lot of us want to just default and say, honey, you're doing great. Just keep teaching the kids, keep doing everything. But hear this. I want to say one little statat, statat, statistic that if a man, if you as the dad are on fire for God and love God, the chance of your church, your kids falling away from God only is a 20% chance of falling away. They have an 80% chance of following God if you are radical for God. 80%. But hear this, if the wife is the mom is the spiritual leader and you're kind of just coasting, the chance of them following God, if you're not following God, they'll be like you. They, they have only a 20% chance of following God. No matter how golly the wife is. Because guess what? Dad, boys are looking to their dads to say, show me how to be a dad. Do you remember the commercial? How many of you are old enough to remember the smoking commercial where the, the dad smoking a cigarette and the little kids grabbing his butt, the cigarette butt and pretending he's smoking? Remember that? Boys want to be like their daddy. And so, daddy, guess what? It's time for us to step up and love Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's time to say, follow me. Amen? You can clap for that. <laughs> and if you say, well, my kid's already grown up, then start now. How many know God's a redeemer? He can buy back the wasted years. That's what redemption means. He buys back the wasted years. And some of you husbands right now are saying, yeah, yeah, Craig, I know all this. I know it. Treat your wife with understanding. I should honor my wife. I know that I should treat her like a cherished vessel. I got it. But God knows that us as guys, he knows that sometimes we need some motivation, don't we? Sometimes we need a little kick in the butt. Sometimes we need to go, okay, so if I don't do this, what's going to happen? Here it is. So God through Peter says, guys, I'm going to give you a great motivation. I'm going to give you that kick in the butt. Here it is. Why should we do all these things? Why should we listen to 1 Peter 3, 7? This is it. Because it's Mother's Day. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not just. How many know this shouldn't be just done on Mother's Day, man? You know, I was telling my wife, this is how bad of a husband I am. I go, remember, honey, when I used to 
cookie on Mother's Day, breakfast in bed, and strawberry um, waffles. Remember that? And she's like, huh? And I go, I did that, like twice. Well, like 20 years ago? I'm like, well, it's still, you know, there's the day is like a thousand years, a thousand. It was just yesterday. I mean, I'm, come on, you know. But I mean, you know, why did I do it today? I didn't do it today because Mariah did it. Amen. God bless my little daughter. <laughs> yeah, there she is. So get your daughter, husbands, to do that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, golly. I'm in trouble. Where am I here? Mother's Day. We should do it because it's the right thing to do, amen, because God's word, his word says it. Now, here's God's big motivation for us as husbands. They still aren't sure if we're going to honor or do what Peter says. You know you should do it well. It says if you don't do it, then it'll affect your spiritual life greatly. It's like God is saying, if you don't want to listen to and honor the needs of your wife, then I'm not going to listen to your needs either. How many like your prayers answered? Any guys out there like your prayers answered? Then you better listen. The failure to live as godly husband has great spiritual consequences. Hear this, the end of 1 Peter 3, 7, that your prayers may not be hindered. I'll tell you, I pray a lot, but a lot of times I feel like my prayers just bounce and hit off the ceiling. And the Lord will say, hey, how have you been treating your wife? Mm, you know, but that's it. It will literally hinder your prayers from being answered. Some have tried to lighten this. You know, there's liberal commentators. You know, don't you love our, our, the way the word people preach today? They try to make all the hard verses not so hard. They try to make everything so cupcakey. But hear this. They'll say things like this. Well, Peter has in mind here that, that the prayers of the husband and wife would be affected because they're not praying together. That's why. No. Most commentators of old and Good commentators, strong commentators say that since he addresses husbands only, and because he says your prayers, not their prayers or your, your prayers, your prayers to the husband, he is only referring to the prayers of the husband. Husbands, do you want your wife to respect you? Yes. Do you want her to honor you? Yes. Do you want her to wash your dishes and iron your clothes and take care of your kids? Yes. Then hear this. Give her love. Give her understanding. Give her honor. Treat her gently like the boss, like a cherished vessel from God. And hear this, guys. This is a big one. Don't try to fix her, but try just to understand her and listen to her and let her vent off the cares of the day. How many, of that stuff? How many struggle with that? Boy, oh boy. I'm a pastor. I, I know the answer to this. You know? And my wife just goes, blah, blah, blah. she just wants to talk. And I go, but I can fix this. And she goes, I don't want to be fixed. I want to be loved. I want to be understood. I want to be cared for. And I'll tell you, that's, I won't ask you to raise your hands because I know you're stubborn and you won't, but we try that, don't we? How many wives would raise your hands that your husband tries to fix you sometimes? Raise your hand there, wife. Look at that. Okay, there you go. Three wives. They're a little more bold than us husbands. <laughs> if we will do this as husbands, then we will have more love from our wives than we know what to do with. Because a woman is like a power transformer. If you give her one watt of love, of this kind of love that Peter talks about, then they will produce 20 watts of love. And they will have enough love for you, for the kids, for your dishes, for your clothes, and she will still have enough love left over to frustrate her. Amen? <laughs> you need to love her. Because your wife does that. You, I, when I love my wife, she's like, oh! She just beams. She goes crazy. And I want to tell you, I want to learn to do that more. Amen? Husbands, we are called to be like Christ. Hear this. To be initiators of his love. Remember what Jesus said? The God, you've, loved, you've loved me because I first loved you. And what God says to me, I'll get mad at my wife. I know you guys never fight, but I'll get mad. I'll say, it's her fault. She needs to come to me. And the Lord goes, how many times is it your fault? And I, it's, oh, well, it's always my fault. But how many times do I come to you? How many times does God come to you when you're mad at him? <laughs> and he'll go, come on, Craigie, you're dumb. Now stop it. Let's go. But he loves me. And how many know us husbands should be the ones the initiator of love in the relationship? Amen? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Good luck with your marriages. <laughs> no, but 
You need to be the initiator. Because if you're going to be the one that gets respect, then you better be the one that leads. Amen? Mothers, today I want to ask you, wouldn't it be treated with this kind of loving understanding, being made to feel cherished vessel, being understood by your husband, being the greatest mother's gift you could ever get? Amen? Women, hey, speak now, forever hold your peace. Amen? Woo! Yes, girlfriend. All right, you know, let's go. That's the greatest thing. But hear this. It takes some work, guys. You can't do this without Jesus. Amen? You will fail. I have done it many times. But if you, what does the Bible say? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You need to ask, God, help me to love my wife. Now, that might sound bad. You don't, don't pray it around your mouth. Oh, God, help me to love my wife. That wouldn't be good. But you say it quietly. God, help me. Empower me to be like you because I can't do it. And I want to tell you this. I believe that there's an all-out assault on marriages. Amen? Because why? Hear this. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. But I think even higher than that, it's a picture of Christ and the Father. Because remember, Jesus and the Father are one, the Akkad. And we are called to be one, right? The two become one. And how many know that Satan hates that? Satan hates that powerful spiritual union of a husband and wife becoming one, just like the Father. Remember what Jesus said in the, in the prayer in John 17? He said, Lord, make them one just as we are one. And how many know if you can't do that with your own wife, you're not going to do that with your brothers and sisters in Christ? But if it starts, if you can do that with your wife, how many know you're going to be able to do that with your brothers and sisters? We're to be one, not just... Think about this, guys. I've already gone long. I might as well keep going. But hear this, guys. Do you realize how one we're going to be? We're going to be so much oneness in heaven that we're not going to have marriage. Now, can you imagine that? Some of you are going, what? Some young people, what? But hear that. We're going to be so in love with God and each other that we're not going to need marriage. Do you know how wild, how much love that's got to be? For us to not go, I miss earth. I miss my wife. Right? How many know we're not going to miss our wife or husband? Because we're going to have that love with everyone. But how many know it should start with our husbands and our wives? Amen. It should start as husband and wife here. Amen. So I want to pray because I believe Satan has tried so hard to rock the marriages of the church. And I want us to pray. And hear this, guys. Don't just pray now, but pray all the time for the marriages. Pray for your marriage and pray for the marriage of this church that we would be strong and we would be a picture of the oneness of the Father and the Son and a picture of Jesus and the church and that excuse me, would be a blessing to this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this time. And Lord, I know I went long, but I pray that this message would really help us. And that, Father, this would not be a message that, that wives would beat over their husbands' heads, but Lord, it would be a message where they know now, the husbands know what to do. They know to honor their wives. They know to respect them. They know to treat them with, with as a cherished vessel. They know to, to treat them with understanding. And I pray, God, that we would realize this is, to be like you is a task that is impossible without you. So, Father, I ask that you would fill every husband right now with your Holy Spirit, that you would empower them to live for you, that they would allow your love to flow in them and through them, that they would see themselves as that conduit, that pipe, to where your love flows in them and then flows out through them to their wives, first for you and then to their wives and then to their children and then to the people in their workplaces and the people especially at the church, and that, Father, this would be a place where there is oneness, where the Akkad is not just the husband and wife, but the Akkad is also in the body of Christ where we have real close relationships. Lord, especially in these last days, especially when everything's going crazy and every part of us, our flesh wants to pull away and hide out in our homes. Let us come loving our husbands and loving our wives and then loving each other with your love. Bless the marriages of this church. Heal them, Lord. If there's been hurts, heal them. Help the wives to let go of the failures of their husband. Help the husbands let go of the failures of the wife. And help them to start fresh. To allow you to redeem their marriages. Bless them. Strengthen them. Let them, their marriages truly be a reflection of the oneness that is between you and the Father, Jesus. We love you. And we thank you. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone agreed, said, amen. Bless you guys that stand and worship the Lord.